In the name of God, woman, what kind of mother are you that can stand by and see your own child slaughtered? Sergeant, if I were you, I would go back to the mainland. Stop interfering in things that are no concern of yours. I am going to search every house in this place in the next few hours, and if anybody, including you, stands in my way, they'll be arrested as accomplices to murder. You'll simply never understand the true nature of sacrifice. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 88, the second of our special Halloween choices. We're back to Cole's choice. What are we discussing tonight? Well, we're keeping things light this Halloween, apparently, taking on race with your choice and now religion with mine. And that choice is the folk horror masterpiece, The Wicker Man from 1973, directed by Robin Hardy and starring Christopher Lee, Edward Woodward, Britt Eklund, Diane Salento, and Hammer Films goddess Ingrid Pitt. It was written by Anthony Schaffer, who is most well known for doing a number of the most prominent Agatha Christie adaptations, and is based on David Penner's novel Ritual. It's about a police sergeant who comes from the mainland to an isolated Scottish island to investigate the case of a missing young girl. It begins for me with what is an awkward device, this acknowledgement card at the beginning, the producers thanking Lord Summer Isle and the inhabitants of the island for their cooperation. It seems to imply that somehow the film is at least somewhat documentary in nature, and that there is tacit approval of the release of this footage on the part of the participants that we eventually see murder someone. Now, I get the, this is based on a true story gimmick that we often see employed in horror to give something added impact, but do we need this here? Does this benefit the film in any way? I'm assuming you're coming down on the side of no. No, it seems a little awkward and forced. Unnecessary, I guess, more than anything. I guess I don't really think about it, and I forget that it's there until I watch it again. If anything, I do sort of understand it because Lord Summer Isle and the residents of Summer Isle are certainly unashamed of their actions. They take pride and even glee in them. So if it were in fact true, I would see this as their promotional film. Get away from it all in Summer Isle. Come for the pig's bladders, stay for the ritual executions. The thing that does work really well for me in this opening, I love the music. I am a sucker for this stuff. Fairport Convention, Pentangle, Steel Eye Span. The band that did this score, Magnet, was actually formed expressly for this project. And it's interesting because the music conjures very specifically British folk images and connections, but the songs were written by an American, a guy from New York named Paul Giovanni. Paul Giovanni had wanted to get Pentangle, as you mentioned, and it was Gary Carpenter, the musical director, who suggested that They instead use he and his friends, they formed that group Magnet, because they would just simply be much cheaper. Initially, they were called Lodestone before they discovered that someone else was already using that name. Nerds. You want to start a band with me and call it Gollum Roll to Crit 20? Or is that what you call Led Zeppelin already? Oh, God. I don't want to form any band or sing about anything related to Hobbits, please. This music is beautiful, and it calls forth all of this tradition and history, even though I don't share that same culture. But you do in a way, with your Virginia roots. All of that stuff came down to the Appalachians, and you can draw a straight line from the music of the Holler to the music of the Celts, the Scots. Very true, but I feel like by the time it got down to where I was... That it's more like the sound of a banjo that harkens to something inside of me, instead of a mandolin or a lute. I was waiting for you to try to explain to me how Earth, Wind, and Fire is a direct descendant of all those things. (laughs) I did also grow up with that music in equal parts. Well, some of the band appear in the film, and some of the other cast members actually perform the songs on the soundtrack. And for faux folk, I think 
it ironically adds a layer of authenticity that it wouldn't have otherwise. It adds to the atmosphere, and I feel like I connect with it a great deal more when the cast is actually performing the songs. And that tone is set right away. We get not one, but two different songs in the opening credits, which is highly uncommon. I like Corn Riggs and Barley Riggs, but I love that very first song. It's an arrangement of a Robert Burns ballad called The Highland Widow's Lament. Corn Riggs is based on a Burns ballad too, but I like this one better of the two. I really like how much you can hear the room in the recording of Highland Widow's Lament. You can hear the sound coming off the walls. It's so beautiful. And then the earthy sensuality of Corn Riggs gives us a hint of the behavior that we will soon see in the village. As a rule, you enjoy musicals much more than I do, and there is a lot of musical performance in this. Did you think of this that way, or did it strike you as having connections to that cinematic tradition at all? Robin Hardy was reported to have said, well into the filming of this, that he was making a musical. I can see it. The performances do seem quite natural, and they happen where they're supposed to happen in the story. And as we work our way through the plot, through the game that's created, through the frolic, through the procession, it seems completely appropriate that music is there every step of the way. But at the same time, I don't think of it as a more traditional kind of musical. But I like that naturalistic feel in the same way that I adore that so much of this film takes place outside. There were more than 20 separate locations for the film. And so if we can quibble about the very beginning title card, it still feels like it's rooted in reality because there's just no place to hide those kinds of tricks. Well, these 20 locations are scattered over a very small place, as it turns out. And this credit sequence gives us a good idea of the size and the isolation of Summer Isle. Sergeant Howie lands his plane in the bay only to be told he can't come ashore as it's private property, but he will not be dissuaded. A complaint was registered by an inhabitant about a missing child and duty must be done. I like that our first introduction to him is him yelling a demand and then using a bullhorn to be even more annoying. And the villagers themselves pay no notice, won't give him what he wants, but I'm not really on their side right away either. I also kind of want to shake them a little bit. So I like that I don't really know where my loyalties should lie. Well, faces appear at every window. Everyone wants to see, but no one wants to help. Something is clearly suspicious. Everyone would, or at least should, know everyone on this island. So that when they say they don't recognize this girl in the photo... It's obvious that they are clearly playing games. There's a glee to their denial, a thing you mentioned already. And it's something that I notice in going back to it. The Wicker Man affects me in a similar fashion as your choice, Get Out, in the sense that upon subsequent viewings, you read everyone's reactions and participation entirely differently. Now I realize when they appear at their windows, their curiosity is actually anticipation. Their denials are manipulations, not deflections. They are positioning him, staging him. It is a whole island of cats playing with a mouse. And with subsequent viewings, you can focus on their word choice, which sometimes makes a very big difference. Oh, you think I'm going to talk religion and not get into semantics? We're going to get into semantics. Our constable goes along to the post office to meet Mae Morrison. It's the woman he understands to be the mother of the missing girl. And already we have a neat little nod to the conflict that's at the root of the film, pre-Christian and Christian religions and their uneasy coexistence. It's apparent even in the character names like this one. May, that part's easy. The month of May figures prominently in the film. One of the village's principal celebrations, May Day, is just around the corner. May is springtime, renewal, and growth. And the association is an ancient one, a pagan one. Morrison, on the other hand is an anglicized version of the name that means the son of the servant of the Virgin Mary. It does not get more Christian than that. There's also some interesting interplay here about the difference between a hare and a rabbit. When Howie meets May's real daughter, quote-unquote, he asks her about Rowan, the missing girl, only to be told that she's a hare now. The hare, too, is obviously tied to springtime and growth. It's a fertility symbol, something that this community is way into. And it, too, is a much older idea. It's a quick and quick-witted animal, and it figures in pre-Christian traditions as everything from a trickster to a creator. But I think the most important thing about it that ties to the deeper themes of the film is how it embodies contradiction and uneasy juxtaposition. 
The animal is both clever and foolish, carnal and pure. A couple of small details here that I really like. There's her youngest daughter, Myrtle, and then Rowan, whom we haven't met yet. Both named after trees, and most of the villagers here are named after flowers or trees. And then the post office itself, which doubles as the sweet shop. If you're paying any attention at all, as Sergeant Howie is clearly not, you've got to notice the crazy designs and all the interesting, bizarre things taking place here. The one little detail like that that I really like right away is the evil eye on the prow of the boat. That was not made for the film. It was already like that. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Our next spring vacation? Do you mean go to Summer Isle for vacation? Or do you mean go to the Mediterranean where this evil eye on the boat thing actually originates and just sail around the bays cursing people? Either way, as long as I can get some bread in the shape of a hair. Howie is pretty uptight, don't you think? When is he ever not on official business? And Edward Woodward is so wonderful here, projecting that barely controlled rage at any given moment. And again, he notices nothing. Everyone's giving off such clear signals, so gleefully. When he at last goes to the Green Man Inn, where he's going to be staying, the music and all of the noise comes to a full stop. Everyone practically looks at each other out of the corner of their eye. And he just looks subtly or not subtly disgusted the whole time. Yeah, this may not be the best environment for him. The Green Man Inn is a regular body house. He is treated to a rousing rendition of the landlord's daughter. I could spend a night or two on Summer Isle, I've decided after seeing this performance. In the course of the evening, though, he notices the photo for the Summer Isle Harvest Festival from 1972, the previous year, is missing. Every other year is represented with a young girl, a maiden, on top of the Harvest Bounty. Speaking of maidens, or not so much, and bounty... When he criticizes the food, Willow, the innkeeper's daughter, comes back with, Some things in their natural state have the most vivid colors. Summer Isle is not a subtle place. I can see where he might need some air after all this, and leaving the inn for his evening constitutional, he encounters quite the party. A combination of rampant public fornication and grave tending. The naked women weeping on the gravestone is a particularly vivid image. You've got to get your mourning done while everyone else is having a rutting orgy. Two birds, one stone. That saying originated in Summer Isle, and it's exactly what it refers to. Well, he can't get away from any of it, whether it's the brazen landlord's daughter, or the naked people everywhere, or the weird wrestling happening in the pub when he stomps back into it. He's just furious all the time. All he can try to focus on is getting his initial report done and then praying. I imagine this character spends a lot of time like this, vacillating back and forth between insane rage and prayer. He's a very pious man, and in this instance he's reflecting on leading a service, particularly a communion ceremony. All I can think in this scene is that this is one of the things that adherents of one religion often don't seem to get. Beware of thinking yours is the right one the only sensible one, and that everyone else's is crazy. I get the significance of ritual and symbolism, but no one's is better or worse. No one's is more reasonable than any other when it comes to these symbolic acts, especially when they mimic the consumption of the flesh and blood of your deity. What the communion ceremony represents is just as peculiar and barbarous as a number of comparable ceremonies, much more so in many cases. I thought you were going to say that the thing he doesn't realize is that the sex looks like it would be super fun. So what's the harm? Willow is calling to you, thumping the wall rhythmically. The detail, it's all in the details here, that I love is that he presses himself into the door hinge and uses his far hand to open it, sort of making a choice, not exactly, and then slamming it again trying to bury himself, trying to bury his loins somehow and deny his feelings? Her attempted seduction of him through the wall, the length of this scene, does it equate to exploitation to you? Because we have Britt Eklund dancing around her room, topless, naked in a couple of rear shots with a double, for a long time, for the duration of this song, 
Does it seem excessive? Not to me, because I don't feel uncomfortable. This feels like the natural state. This feels like joy or even just lust playing out, and I don't find anything wrong with that. I like the way you think. I, too, am on this summer aisle wavelength, and it seems to me that someone considering it exploitation just exposes exactly what you said, how uncomfortable they are with the human form. And, like you, I have a solution for him. Just go when she calls. Again, two birds, one stone. Virginity problem solved. You'll sleep better, and you won't get stuck in a wicker man. We're clearly making light of this decision. He, of course, does not. It's life and death to him. It is his soul. It's life and death to them, too. They need to confirm this. They need to test whether or not they have chosen the right man. It makes me wonder how many they have sent for before that weren't able to resist the invitation and then just got back on the plane the next day none the wiser. Or the little a summer aisle population sign went up a couple of numbers. <laughs> well, let's get into our phallic symbols, oh, shall perfect. we? We see the maypole being constructed as Willow brings Sergeant Howie his breakfast. His response to why didn't you come to me is that I'm engaged and it's not right before marriage. Her quite logical rejoinder to that is, you probably don't want to be around here on May Day then. I never had a Maypole celebration when I was a kid, so I'm not sure where this fits in. But in this instance, it's the boys who formulate it. And they're being led in song by an older adult, a song all about a seed to make people. And everyone is happily joining in with this. We did do a maypole when I was in grade school. It fit squarely up beside our square dance classes that we took. We didn't sing a song like this, but I'm sure the meaning of ours was not actually that much farther off. This song that's performed around the maypole, this is a really intriguing way to deliver a myth. Music is a powerful thing for this purpose. I don't know about you, but I remember songs forever. There are literally thousands of them in my head that I can recall whole, even though I haven't heard many of them for years, Decades in some cases. The number of sermons I can repeat verbatim? Zero. I also put hymns in that category. I remember so few of those because they seem to follow no structure that makes any sense to me. I only remember ones I heard on the Andy Griffith show. Now, before I align myself too much with the villagers, I find their method suspect too. It's all indoctrination, no matter your philosophy. And I balk at how much their educational system and their church are in sync with one another. Howie observes them at the school, teaching their paganism, and he is extremely disturbed. His objections, though, are motivated by different concerns than mine, and my knee-jerk reaction to him is that his pearl-clutching can go take a flying leap. He puritanically refers to what they are discussing as filth, and it's an interesting word choice. In the UK, the police are referred to as filth. He writes Rowan's name on the chalkboard, and to do so, he has to erase some information detailing the protective or healing properties of material like toadstone. And I love these the way they crop up. It's another symbolic juxtaposition of the two divergent paths. And he has placed the subject of his righteous quest directly adjacent to and above their pagan teachings. He's nothing more than that little beetle tied around a nail going round and round and round. One of the young women in the class has made it so in this empty desk that clearly, conspicuously, must be Rowan's. But he just can't see his place in this game yet. And just as importantly, we see that the villagers are clearly not above cruelty as entertainment for themselves. Why in God's name do you do it is a question that he asks some variant of more than once. Not only can he not see that he's the beetle, he can't see anything except for this rigid, narrow path that he walks. His scope is too narrow. This inability to imagine another way is almost laughable sometimes. In fact, he's laughed directly at more than once. He finds evidence of Rowan and her connection to the post office in the school registry, and he chastises the class as despicable little liars. They are toying with him. But are they lying exactly? I'm not sure... I'm convinced that they think they are when he has this conversation with the teacher outside. When Howie and Miss Rose, the teacher, go outside to have this longer discussion about basically comparative religion, I'm not really sure either if everyone is just in on it, believes it, or some combination of those two things. 
neither can really allow for the other to exist in the same place at the same time. Which is more believable to young people? Reincarnation or resurrection? Transmutation of the soul? Rowan could be a hare? Dead but not dead? They believe that their souls return to Earth somehow, into the Earth, into some aspect of nature. And so you could read Miss Rose as being a more intellectual voice of reason, or listen to what she's saying and not believe it either. But everyone has to go along somehow. When I listen to her, I find their positions not that far apart, actually. She tells him they don't use the word dead, that it's debatable that Rowan is, quote, in, unquote, the, quote, churchyard, unquote. The main thing her explanation does for me is it just underscores the mental gymnastics and semantic trickery that's present in all religion, even the most ancient ones. Christianity as a comparative religion is an idea that is completely lost on Howie. Some humility regarding his faith would serve him a lot better, I feel like. He's got a full head of steam now, like he often has, and he heads to the churchyard in search of Rowan's grave, and he encounters a number of interesting epitaphs, my favorite of which was protected by the ejaculation of serpents. It paints a picture, for sure. <laughs> but I don't believe that any more than I believe the woman breastfeeding holding an egg, which represents a fertility ritual. She's hoping for another baby. I don't see either of those th things happening, nor do I feel that I'm eating the body of Christ. If my only choice was between the two religions, and I think it would be on Summer Isle, I'm going to pick the one that allows for doing it for fun. Which may in part be at the root of this question that I kept coming back to. As I watch him careen around the island in a rage, why is he so angry? I suppose that having your foundational ideas challenged will do that to you. But he strikes me as a character for whom being beset by iniquity on all sides is not a new complication. It makes me think back to that John McEnroe documentary that we just watched to do an episode about on the Patreon, and how Howie seems to share a similar characteristic. If he didn't have an enemy, a crusade, he would have to invent one. It makes me wonder why he specifically was sent on this assignment. Was it to get him out of the way? Do you give the worst assignments to the worst people? It reminds me a bit of Hot Fuzz, a movie I know you don't particularly care for, <laughs> but it's that same idea of sending the uptight guy out to the sticks to get rid of him so the rest of us can continue to have some fun around here. I see some of that. I also think that Lord Summer Isle may have some strings that he could pull, because they specifically want him. But you're right, I watch him thrash about here conducting this investigation, and it is so hampered by his zealotry that he can't objectively view the proceedings at all. Instead, he's preoccupied with reframing everything to fit his will, his worldview, going as far as placing a makeshift cross on Rowan's altar. And the workplace stuff may come into it. At the very least, this is horrible detective work. Would you trust him to handle evidence or to process a crime scene correctly without bias? What does he think he's doing? He's a police officer, not an exorcist. I guess he thinks he's a shepherd and a savior. Well, maybe he should just stick to doing his job instead. Maybe rein in that job description a little bit. To his credit, he does eventually find Rowan Morrison's grave, and it's decorated with a tree adorned with her navel skin. Rowan lies under a Rowan. He asks to see a minister, because he can't conceive of any other way, and that request is met with some more of that derisive laughter I talked about. He is still not getting it. So it's back to the post office, where we discover Mrs. Morrison administering the time-honored cure for a sore throat of putting a frog in the mouth of the afflicted. And he says, you're all raving mad, as if somehow the entire course of Christianity came with modern medicine. I assume that's just how he classifies everyone that does not profess to have the same beliefs that he does. Side note, because of personal experience, however, this is the one instance that I find his position relatable. If my sister walked in on this scene, she too would say that you were raving mad. She has a near debilitating fear of frogs, true phobia level stuff. It's a scar that lingers from a childhood incident, and she might literally die if I tried to stick a frog in her mouth. Did you also cause the childhood incident? For once, it was not me. It was our uncle. The most David Yao of our uncles. 
So he continues the investigation, and he's thwarted in his search for documents. Authority to view these things comes from his lordship, but Howie won't stand for that. He bullies his way into accessing these records, and then follows the trail to the village apothecary slash photographer. This, I think, is an intriguing shop, to say the least. Kudos to the art director, Seamus Flannery. This is a beautiful set. Interspersed with the bandages and medicines are ram's heads. Next to the jar of gumballs is a vessel filled with foreskins and a vat of deformed fetal pigs. The production design for this was impeccable, I thought. And it's most obvious for me when it comes to the May Day procession. There are some spectacular details in that, including the human-sized baked version of John Barleycorn, which I loved to see. So far, we've been given some pretty overt hints about the harvest itself. He's not served any fresh vegetables, no fresh apples, and that's what the island is known for. Ingrid Pitt in the records area is eating tinned peaches. But it's when we go to Lord Summer Isle's estate that we see everything in bloom. Including the flower of youth. No exaggeration. On the way there, he passes a mini Stonehenge sort of setting where another ritual is taking place. He finally gets to meet Lord Summer Isle, and it is not Coloween without Christopher Lee at least one time. Christopher Lee said this was his favorite part of all time. Edward Woodward did as well. Referring to the scene that Howie just witnessed, Summer Isle says he hopes that he found it refreshing. To which, of course, he most certainly did not. Well, I certainly did. Sun-dappled 70s girls with names like Willow and Meadow, gauzy sunshine, gauzy clothes, wildflowers, butts galore. As religions go, I have to say I like their aesthetic. There's an interesting note here about the concept of reproduction without sexual intercourse, which is also really interesting, but we don't linger on it. Lord Summer Isle is a fascinating character, and I understand why Christopher Lee was so drawn to him. This island was transformed by his Victorian grandfather. Before his grandfather bought it, it was barren, everyone was poor, it was a subsistence way of life. And his grandfather brought in science to transform their lives. New strains of fruit meant that new things could be grown and the island could flourish. He also brought the old gods back. Ministers fled, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the old fun ways returned. They learned again to love and fear nature, to rely on it and appease it. So what does Lord Summer Isle believe of this? Is he basically the tour director walking us through this? Or has that way of life become ingrained for him? I want to talk about that more later, but I'd love to hear your thoughts here. I'm torn on it because we catch him in an obvious lie about it. When he's talking about this ritual, I think he positions it as evidence of how much they revere life and are dedicated to this bucolic serenity. He specifically says, we don't commit murder here. We're a deeply religious people. Uh, slow down, buddy. Don't break your arm patting yourself on the back just yet. Howie barrels ahead in typical Howie fashion and continues to be unable to wrap his head around the existence of any spiritual path except his own rigid one. I do appreciate the inherent pragmatism of paganism. It's much too dangerous to jump over fire with clothes on. Duh and or hola. But how he outright calls their religion, their science, everything, everything they live by and they teach their children, fake. I do think that Summer Isle believes what he says about the old gods not being dead, and that definitely leaves no room for what Howie proclaims to be the true god, quote-unquote. That god had his chance, he blew it. A statement that I think works two ways for Summer Isle. He believes it, certainly, but he also is using it definitely to wind Howie up a little. He's enjoying that part of it. Ultimately, what it comes down to, no fruitful debate can come from either of the parties involved here. They each simply have too much invested in being right. When I listen to this history of Summer Isle that you describe, founded by a scientist, an agronomist, and free thinker, Lord Summer Isle's explanation makes as much sense to me as anything else, maybe more, but it's evident that people cling to the thing that appears to benefit them the most. For Howie, that's the Anglican Church. For the inhabitants of the island, it's the songs, the drama, the reverence and fear of nature. Howie says pagan here like it's a dirty word. 
insisting that Summer Isle, whether he likes it or not, is the subject of a Christian country. And immediately my defenses go up. Now it's your turn to slow down, pal. Or maybe it's mine, actually, when I think about it. Being a Yankee upstart, I bristle at this. I have it firmly ingrained in me that the separation of church and state is valuable. But I have to remind myself that technically he's correct. In the UK, there is a constitutionally established state religion. People like Howie are why other people got on boats and rolled the dice on the new world in the 17th century. The thing about it is this. The question that he is essentially asking with his every word and action is, how dare you practice your religion in broad daylight? At this point, I freely admit this character is infuriating to me. Everything he says implies that the village abandoned Christianity. And I take serious issue with that characterization. Because of the date of the establishment of the colony, no one who is alive on the island in the present day ever even practiced Christianity. You can't abandon a thing that you never embraced. This default position that the white Western world is, and even worse, should be Christian, is troubling to me. And we see this again in his attitude upon the exhumation of Rowan's grave. They find a hair in the casket, and we encounter even more semantics. It has to be explained to him that what he found is only sacrilege if the ground is consecrated to the Christian God. He is incredulous that paganism is thriving. How dare it do that? I'm not going to dip my toe in those waters. All I can say is to him again, then don't be here on May Day. How many times do you have to be told? However many times he's told, it's not enough. He goes snooping in the pharmacist's darkroom, and he finds that photo from 1972, and it's Rowan Morrison. Comparing it to previous photos from the bounty on display, it's clear that the crops failed, that she was a sacrifice. At least he thinks he's cracked it. He follows this breadcrumb trail to the library now and learns more about the spring festivals and their hallmarks. The celebrations of fertility, the role of the teaser, the function of the privileged simpleton and king for a day, the priest conducting rituals while wearing the skin of the sacrificial victim off on a child. Some of these are grim, graphic details. His research gives him just enough information to get him into more trouble and tellingly, conveniently, doesn't confront him with what, for him, might be the most uneasy association of all. The fact that a good number of the major Christian holidays have pagan roots. Even if the early Christians were only co-opting these celebrations as Trojan horses for their doctrine, I believe the associations were not that clear-cut, they are inextricably intertwined with the history and evolution of these celebrations. So he thinks he knows what they've done and what they're planning to do. And he's threatening everyone with an earshot that he's going back to the mainland, but coming back immediately with more officers. It's that image, the quick pan from him to everyone in the village popping up with those rustic animal masks that gets me. It's obvious now in this scene where his plane has been sabotaged that this thing has taken on a new deadly momentum. They're still toying with him. I love the delivery of this line. I'm not obstructing you, Sergeant. And here we also have my favorite aspect of the production design. These brilliant masks that you mentioned. I love masks of all types. In horror, not in horror, any time. The questions of identity that they raise. Their function as a canvas for us to project our feelings onto. The liberating quality of being the one employing them. And these masks are some of my favorite in all of film. You have a terrifying collection of masks. They live in the shed, and now as I say that, I assume our shed is haunted. The shed is the perfect place for them. You're not allowed to wear them in the house. We established that long ago. I can't interact with you. Not to make it sound like you're asking to and that we have some sort of weird dynamic just around Halloween. I don't want to turn the corner and see you putting one on. We don't have that kind of weird dynamic, but we can start one if you want. Nope, shut that down right now. Well, at any rate, starting here, the film really begins to also nail down the elements of this that make this one of the definitive works of folk horror. We've talked on the Patreon, I think it was, about how I enjoy what Grail Marcus termed the old weird America. I like the old weird Britain, too. The old weird anywhere will likely be my favorite period and vibe of whatever the place is. Nowhere more than Britain, though, embodies the folk horror tradition. 
The uniquely British intersection of landscape, folklore, and superstition provides the blueprint for all others to follow. The central conflict in folk horror, though sometimes supernatural, is most often rooted in ideological differences. Even more specifically, the clash of country and city, old ways versus new, like we see in this. And folk horror often postulates that the supposed sophistication and intelligence of the urban interlopers does them no good. It is, in fact, a disadvantage when it's up against ancient forces that they can't possibly understand. Our relationship with the natural world is often essential to the proceedings. And all of those things kick into overdrive once he has to abandon this plan to return to the mainland and instead navigate this baffling maze of revelers in the guise of woodland creatures. I'm sure he's thinking it's a good thing that he'll be here to save the day as Lord Summerisle announces that a sacrifice is going to be made. He's going to infiltrate this celebration and stick it to these dirty heathens. Once again, like you, I get the impression on Summer Isle they have a good time all the time until some killjoy comes around. I didn't grow up in New York City, for example. I grew up in a small town in the American South. We definitely have our own tradition of folk horror. I think about the landscape that I grew up in as being steeped in blood. The American Revolution, the Civil War, and all of the haunts and ghosts that come with it. I'm assuming you were like me, and I devoured those kinds of stories when I discovered them as a child. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Young Goodman Brown, an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, all the way up through things like The Lottery. I could recognize those characters. I could recognize those landscapes. Did you have any of your own favorites, especially Oklahoman or Comanche? I like all the ones you've mentioned specifically because I definitely like that early American feeling. But yes, growing up with one foot in each camp, there were definitely the native ones that stuck with me too. The two in particular that I can think of that I still think about to this day, Dear Woman and Ninapes. Of the two, Dear Woman is probably the more prevalent myth. John Landis even made one of the Masters of Horror installments about it. Ninapes, if you've never heard of them, are just another of the variant of malevolent little people. If you've seen a film like Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, that type of character, they're tiny little creeps. Don't trust them. My enjoyment of folk horror is kind of a perplexing puzzle for me. We often talk about how horror is a fundamentally conservative genre, and of the subgenres, this one seems ultra-conservative. It emphasizes superstition and faith over science and reason, so it's somewhat anti-intellectual. It could be interpreted as being nationalist in outlook. None of these things are remotely close to the way I live my life day to day, and yet I find these films incredibly compelling. Do you have the same feeling or inner conflict about that? I think the conflict plays out in the best of these examples. It's the counterculture coming to terms with this idea of this bucolic countryside not being all that it's cracked up to be. And these villager characters, whether here or in something like Pinda's Finn, or the other two greats, The Blood on Satan's Claw and Witchfinder General, are incredibly complex. They're not heroes either. I don't think that the anti-intellectualism wins the day. I think there's more to be said. I was reading something interesting about exploring these kinds of films now and new folk horror stories that are being made, especially those in Britain in this post-Brexit atmosphere that it doesn't do any good to interpret these traditions in this incredibly literal way, that we have to have curiosity about what is beyond us. Curiosity for history, but a refusal to lapse into nostalgia. You know, I'm on board with that. Absolutely. So less about nativism, but still examining these stories and finding what is beneficial in these traditions and moving forward at the same time with an open mind. Well, did we mention that this movie flies by? Every time that I realize we're hurtling toward the finale right here, it feels like we've only been watching for 20 minutes. Sergeant Howie now suspects that Rowan is still alive. She wasn't sacrificed, past tense, but she's actually being held until she can be offered up for sacrifice for this celebration. He's been told multiple times that if I were you, I would go back to the mainland. He steadfastly refuses to take that advice. That opening scene that we did, you will simply never understand the true nature of sacrifice. He's about to get his chance. 
While the islanders are making preparations for their celebration, in the meantime, he is turning the village upside down. He's searching every house, rifling through drawers, throwing open wardrobes, and I love that moment when the girl that's playing dead falls out of hers and then ever so slightly moves her eye up to look at him mockingly. They are joyfully putting him through his paces, and all I can think of at this point is good. He doesn't deserve to peacefully go to his conclusion, make him jump through hoops. Every time I watch this, I find myself getting frustrated with him and his presumptive self-righteousness, just like it is the first time. Do you find yourself having any more sympathy for him than I did at this point? I keep wondering if he's going to make a different choice, or if he's going to grow up or relax a little bit, but you can't tell anyone that. And to make him deny his faith is also not something that I'm really interested in doing either. Multiple viewings make me care less for the other characters. I can see the darkness in them. When I may have taken pleasure in his downfall before, I'm now much more interested in everyone else's motivation. Maybe I just haven't grown up that much yet then, because I do take some pleasure, I do admit, in seeing him get his. Well, only at the Green Man Inn do you take a nap and awaken to the Hand of Glory on your nightstand. In the folklore, this is a powerful artifact, but you can't keep a good brood down. He steals the fool's costume, and our king for a day is off to infiltrate the procession. Little does he know, he is playing right into their hands. This is an intricate plan that they've put together that a lot of pieces have to fall just right for it to work. I'm amazed they pulled it off. He stays true to form the whole time, and that's what they were counting on. I love the procession. Lord Summer Isle prompts him to cut some capers, which is a phrase that I really enjoy. Use your bladders. That's what you're here for. Play the fool. If you were in this procession, what would you like to be? What type of Summer Isle reveler do you picture yourself as? I might have to fight you for this one. I'm going to be the hobby horse. The one who canters charging at the girls. To be honest, I pictured you more as the stick-clapping, stick-your-bottom-out type. Should I go for the Salmon of Knowledge? I, I like that one. That does sound pretty good. In reality, I'd probably rather be the Bear of Sandwiches. Or something like that. The Fox of Dirty Limericks. <laughs> That's a good one, too. I would also take one of the swordsmen who participates in that chopping game. Well, everyone survives the chopping game, and to quote the band The Fix, we reach the beach. I you like that one for you? <laughs> it turns out good. Rowan is bait, sucker. It's the old game of the hunted leading the hunt. Did I do it well? You did it beautifully. In fact, they all did. They have controlled his every movement from the moment he set foot on the island. And it's a good thing, because when it comes to sacrifices, animals are fine, children are even better, but the constable is the ideal. He's come of his own free will. He is the adult virgin, the fool, representing the king, representing the law, though he can't see that he truly has no authority there. Who but this fool would accept the role of king for a day? It's tragic, and he ticks all of the boxes. And this is the culmination of one of my very favorite things about the film, the way it subverts standard horror conventions, specifically about gender. The things that it turns inside out, well, there's a list. The male lead is virginal, and him maintaining that may be the single most crucial aspect of who he is and what he means to them. And male virginity is not played for a running gag the way you might typically see it. It is a vital matter of deadly earnestness. Significantly, this virgin does not survive. Chastity is no sort of safeguard here. The flip side of that, for once, sex is not punished. In practically any other horror film, Willow and her unbridled sexuality, freely and enthusiastically shared, would quickly be killed, likely symbolically penetrated in some way. It's also fascinating to me, going back to that idea of fertility without procreation. That sex is for enjoyment, and that you can also create this family without it. So the women aren't tools. For once, the sexy team wins. And this is one more parallel I see with Get Out. Finally, I see the characters that represent me, that share at least some of my worldview. The sex is awesome, natural, and fun part, not the burning the guy alive part. We finally get to come out on top, no pun intended. Yikes. <laughs> In addition to that... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have Christopher Lee performing the role of the tease in the procession. 
On this most important day, quite possibly in the village's history, the spiritual leader of the group adopts a woman's costume to conduct part of their ritual. And you can read this any number of ways. Celebrating the sacred feminine, embracing androgyny and or bisexuality, just an examination of duality in general. However you read it, it's notable that a key component of the celebration is led by the Lord in the guise of a woman. Now, Christopher Lee has famously said he does not consider this film horror. As much as I am loath to disagree with the greatest Dracula to ever grace the screen, I do think of it as horror. Do you? Is it only horror because of the grisly fate that he meets? Taking everything into account except the ending, do you see the villagers as the villains? And if so, prior to the blood sacrifice of the finale, what is their transgression? As far as I can see, the most diabolical thing they do is demonstrate little regard for his authority and little indulgence of his brand of piety. I suppose history shows us that plenty of people look upon that as horrifying when I think about it. It's no accident that inquisitors and witch finders for centuries focused their hypocritical rage on those that had the temerity to not conform, most especially women. What about this makes it horror for you if it is? Well, beyond the question of religion, they still, as citizens of a nation, are flouting the law, which is still anti-murder. But taking everything into account up until the ending, let's just discount the ending for now. Do you still feel the same way about them before you know they kill? I'm answering one of the questions about what is their transgression, okay. and that is one. I do think of them as villains, but that's not always a bad thing. And I think of him as equally a villain. What he would put in place if he were to come to power. I think my feeling about the villagers minus the murder is more anti-hero than villain. And is it horror? It's not a slasher film. It's not a supernatural ghost story. But the ghosts of the past do inform this present. It's got horrific imagery that we have to learn to live with as being part of our past. And it's got two different sorts of people parroting different views. And the most horrifying part to me is before the ending ending. It's this pleading that he does when he actually becomes the voice of reason to his mind. Your crops failed because they're not meant to be grown here, which can be taken two ways. The actual scientific basis for that, but then his religious basis that it's against nature in the way that he means. My death won't bring them back. And next year, to Lord Summer Isle, your people will kill you if the crops fail. Christopher Lee here as Lord Summer Isle is doing his most interesting interpretation. I do not think that he believes anything that he is saying. He's preserving his own place, first and foremost, this life that he has built, and the patriarchy that he's essentially established. Less a true spiritual leader and someone we would think of more as a lifelong politician. Even a guru, even a savior, there seems to always have to be one in these systems. So he's saying what everyone wants to hear. I don't think that he really believes it. This is about, as you mentioned, choosing the thing that benefits you the most. Well, I ask about discounting the end, and I do that strictly as an exercise, because I know we can't divorce the two. Ultimately, I say good for Howie for sticking to his guns. He may be infuriating, but at least he is committed. I can dislike him and still respect his sincere devotion. As easy as it is to make light of his puritanical qualities, and as much as he's the butt of the cruelest joke imaginable, I feel like if he reversed himself here in the face of imminent death in his final moments, that would actually be the filmmakers mocking his faith. It would devalue everything he stood for in life, and it would cheapen the film in the process. Instead, it earns him a martyr's death, for what that's worth, and it's worth a considerable amount to both parties involved here. It's a characteristic that amplifies the power of choosing him as the sacrifice. In fact, their acknowledgement of that status somewhat validates his choice. It confers a certain nobility upon him. For his part, he lectures, prays, and sings the most Anglican hymns possible until his final breath, truly embracing the role of martyr. According to Robin Hardy, the director, his last words are based on Sir Walter Raleigh's dying words. Before we end, though, I want to talk about how magnificent the Wicker Man is itself. It's astounding. And you say that as someone who's been to Burning Man every year, right? No, 
<laughs> Never, thankfully. So it's the most horrifying thing I've seen in woods so far. But Edward Woodward stayed away from where they were building it so that when we see him dragged toward it and seeing this thing for the first time, oh God, oh Jesus Christ, it's real. And it's also horrifying to watch the villagers light the base. And it's almost a carnival atmosphere as they start to sing the final song, Summer is a Comin'. As that great Edward Woodward tenor starts to become a bellow, almost. And I find even more horror in watching the islanders sing this song together, all joining in, huge smiles on their faces, watching what's taking place before them. I think the most chilling thing to me is the sounds of all the animals squealing as they also burn with him. From my unique perspective as a viewer speaking strictly for myself, I don't have a dog in this hunt. Martyrdom and a dollar gets you something off the Taco Bell value item menu. I am more concerned with the larger lingering question of responsibility. You can call Christopher Lee the villain if you want, but I take exception to that. Religion is the villain of the piece for me. It makes me think about this quote from theoretical physicist Steven Weinberg talking about religion. With or without it, you would have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things, but for good people to do evil things, that takes religion. Howie's misguided and relentless priggishness and entitlement, it leaves no room for anyone else's dignity or self-sovereignty. And as his counterpart, Lord Summer Isle is not only willing to kill to preserve their way of life, but he makes a game out of it, a joke in which burning a man alive is the punchline. These polarities for me are integral to the story. Howie decries their beliefs to the end, asserting the supremacy of his religion with his very last breath, but their faith is equal to his. It's a horrible thing that they're doing, but I am terribly conflicted. A situation that I find myself in with horror films occasionally, for example, I would be lying if I said I didn't at least somewhat identify with, and by extension, root for Michael Myers. Do you find yourself on the side of the monster once in a while? Absolutely. And it was with this viewing that I noticed that difference that I made such a big point about with Lord Summer Isle at the end, defending their choice, justifying their choice. To me, it becomes less about religion versus religion and prosperity versus religion. One, Lord Summer Isle turning it into a business, essentially. Whatever he believed in, if he has any belief system, Whatever he was raised in, this is about keeping the wheels moving and keeping the cogs happy. So if religion can make good people do bad things, money can do the same thing. And for some, those things are interchangeable. Money is their religion. It's one of the most important things that I come back to the genre for again and again, to plumb these depths, to take a look at that part of myself. And the deep, dark question in The Wicker Man, for me and for society at large, I think is what is more important here. That one of these factions is objectively correct, or that they each so completely believe that they are right to the exclusion and, in fact, extinction of the other. That's what we are left to ponder as the wicker man burns and topples as the sun sets. I really enjoyed this viewing of the film. I've seen it several times. And I think I enjoyed it the most now because we watched it after Get Out. We're using kind of those two pieces together. I think there's an argument to be made that Get Out is also folk horror, an American folk horror. And it just put deeper questions into my head. It made me examine these people's motives in a way I hadn't done before. Yeah, that leads me to exactly whatever may be left about why I chose it. I look at public discourse these days and think a lot about how we interact with those whose beliefs are fundamentally different from our own. I don't imagine that will ever change much, and the way that Hardy addressed that while simultaneously avoiding easy genre stereotypes means that The Wicker Man will likely always remain relevant. That leads me directly to my recommendation. Okay, cool. What is it? Something that you also love and that we've talked about briefly on the show before, and that's Robin Redbreast from 1970. It was a play for today from BBC Television, written by John Bowen, directed by James McTaggart, with Anna Cropper, Julian Holloway, Frida Bamford, Bernard Hepton, and Cyril Cross. 
It tells the story of a newly single career woman who moves from London to a rural community in southern England, and her new home and neighbors become more and more strange and frightening the more she comes to know them. I picked it because it still feels relevant in many ways. An aspect of that relevance that I'm definitely feeling right now is all about a person's right to choose. And I say person, not specifically woman, because it could be their own path, a different life, a family, their life versus another's. You're right. I do love this one. If I was to make a top 10 folk horror list, this would be on it near the top. It deserves to be mentioned in the same breath, I think, as Witchfinder General, as Blood on Satan's Claw. I don't quite like it as much as The Wicker Man, but it's darn close. And how about you? My recommendation this time is The Dark Secret of Harvest Home, which was originally a miniseries that aired on NBC in 1978. It was directed by Leo Penn and stars Betty Davis, David Aykroyd, Joanna Miles, Rosanna Arquette in a very early role for her, Rene Aubergenois, Norman Lloyd, and Michael O'Keefe. It's based on Thomas Tryon's novel Harvest Home and is about a young couple that moves to a quiet New England village only to soon find themselves swept up in sinister pagan ritual goings-on. There was a lot of great horror on television in the 70s, and this was an event on the scale of something like Salem's Lot. Along with Trilogy of Terror, Harvest Home was one of the very first things I remember that scared me. I will never forget, as long as I live in the second half of the program, when they discover René Aubergeois' character with his tongue cut out and his mouth sewn shut. That blew my goddamn eight-year-old mind. Simultaneously, this was my introduction to folk horror as well, which would end up being a lifelong pursuit of this particular type of thrills and chills. Overall, it still holds up okay. The second half moves faster than the first. The accents range from good to Pepperidge Farm remembers to whatever Michael O'Keefe is doing to none at all. And let's talk about corn. Is corn the scariest of all crops? As an American, 100%. Soybeans don't terrify you? Sweet potatoes, no? Driving cross country in the middle of the night in a thunderstorm only to have lightning strike the car next to you and realize that it's an endless cornfield, that has some resonance. It wouldn't be the same if I looked over and it was alfalfa. Well, as of this recording, this is on YouTube. And if you go looking for it, find the version that's almost four hours long. That is correct and complete. If you find the three or even two hour version, you will be missing a lot. I've only seen the first half, but I really liked the character that Betty Davis plays, the widow. Widow Fortune. That's such a great American folk horror name. And she could definitely go one way, but she subverts those expectations. She's always ready to laugh, and that's how they get you. And I say this was an event. That's Betty freaking Davis. That is a huge get for a made-for-TV horror movie. So as usual, that's two great recommendations, Robin Redbreast and The Dark Secret of Harvest Home. And that brings us to the end of episode 88. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you'll never have to go a week without new magic lantern in your life. We have our special Halloween mini episodes, and then I think I'm planning some fun stuff I'm going to talk about being head of house for Hufflepuff. I'll share my growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist. You know, just those general <laughs> stories, right, babe? Sounds riveting. I am also doing a new thing for Coloween where I am reading some of my favorite classic spooky stories. So you'll have some seasonal treats to listen to if you're into that sort of thing. And those will be available to all patrons, no matter what the level of support. If you would like to just get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Travis Trudell, Andy Wolverton, Terry Osterhout, Audie Christianos, Mel Cartagena, 
Jeff Duncanson, Matt Gasteyer, Chad Engelbert, and the fine gentleman at Fuds on Film. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts you can find us. Many thanks to Michael Hudgens this time for leaving us an updated review of the show. If you'd like to leave a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>